Welcome to the Crazy Channel, where we talk about complex games in simple terms. This video, however, isn't about stylish gameplay, but instead what's hidden behind the cameras of Devil May Cry 5. And who better than a Devil May Cry series speedrunner to show that? My name is D.E. Cosmic, and I will be your guide today, as we use a special camera tool to learn what tricks Capcom used when making their cutscenes, how they build the levels, and even what's beyond the boundaries of gameplay. So without further ado, let's get started. For the fifth entry in the series, Capcom decided to build the menus entirely with real-time 3D elements, taking advantage of the technological advancements since the last entry they developed, back in 2008. There are high-resolution animated characters, staged lighting, small narratives, and plenty of details. And it all starts the second you boot the game. For the start menu screen, the developers created a unique location that you'll never actually visit as a player. Right in the center of the screen stands the demonic Lyphoth tree, which is often seen throughout the game. However, the one present here has a lot more detail than the ones you see later, as the simplicity of the scene allows it without taxing the hardware and affecting performance. Our three main characters themselves are standing here in heroic poses, but their faces are pretty much expressionless, and looking behind them over to the opposite side is an empty street ending in a chasm. Plus, the Devil May Cry 5 logo looks comically flat on Nero's back. Moving on to the main menu, as I mentioned before, each menu has its own small story to tell. The protagonists flip through magazines, Lady desperately looks for a towel after her shower, Nico shows off a new version of a Devil Breaker. It's a great characterization. But look a little too close at what you shouldn't, and you'll get to see some funny faces here and there. Usually, when Nico's van is located inside some level, the developers made sure that the surroundings can only be observed through a window or an opened door. But if we just put some distance between us and the scene, we'll see that in most of these menus, it's a boxy, low-poly version of the van, hovering in nothingness, or in barely drawn surroundings, such as this scene before the start of the third mission. Even the results screen, which at first glance doesn't seem to have anything special about it, is built entirely in 3D. And if you decide to look away from your incredible S rank, you'll see that you're sitting atop some building's roof, probably in Osaka, where the Capcom offices reside. These are some of the secrets hidden in just the menu screens alone. Now let's have a look at some locations where there are even more interesting things. One of the new features introduced in Devil May Cry 5 was photo mode, but the developers made sure to not put too much power in our hands. But with our camera, we can see that the path from the beginning of each mission all the way to the end is divided into separate sections, which are preloaded as you progress through the level. This works in reverse as well, of course. As you move forward, chunks of the level you just passed are offloaded. This is a standard memory optimization method that Capcom uses here. Thanks to this approach, players don't need to endure mid-level loading times, and our computers, hopefully, don't catch fire. The environment in the game with which players can interact is usually made without many tricks and workarounds. We didn't find any forgotten assets under the levels, nor models climbing on top of each other or something similar. Even the borders of the combat zones look quite organic, being just rounded textures. Although, the far-off backgrounds of the levels did catch our attention. For example, the view of the ruined city in Mission 2, with its remains pierced by the roots of the Hellish Clyphoth. The panorama does look pretty good from a distance, completing the chaotic demonic apocalypse vibe. Flying up closer does make it look a lot funnier. Green pyramids, flat cars, cardboard box houses doesn't really make you fear the end of the world, but from afar, it does the job. Or here, let's take a look at the 11th mission, with the gigantic Clyphoth in the middle of it, where the level designers scattered the same low polygon city ruins along the edges. Fun fact, these assets spread so far that the area where the actual gameplay takes place accounts for about 5% of the overall space. Okay, getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Let's go back to some of the first locations you visit. You can see this later in game if you pay attention, but Goliath appears atop the tower the moment the game loads the last third of the level. He sits still, patiently, waiting for the start of his cutscene with Nero, and as you come closer to his location, he starts moving. 
Mission 5 takes place in a tunnel connected to an industrial shipyard. When V passes the first arena, a static model of the Gilgamesh boss will spawn in the area above. Then the monster will teleport to the place where it's scripted to stick its legs through the floor. From below, we can only make out the limbs, but the full model is present above and even has a unique animation that we're never able to see any other time. When it's done attacking, it takes out its leg and freezes until the next time. In Mission 7, after exiting the subway, you see another Clifothru rising from the destroyed Redgrave City, surrounded by a flock of pyrobats. Their animation frame rate is reduced in order to not tax your CPU. This trick is common in modern games and can also be seen in Resident Evil 2 Remake, where zombies closer to the player are animated more smoothly than those far away. Throughout the game, our heroes return to the Clifoth tree repeatedly. While you may get tired of the fleshy roots inside it, the environmental artists deserve credit for creating a convincing blood circulation system. In missions 14 and 15, these bloody tunnels aren't just coming from nowhere, but instead from a kind of heart covered in icy thorns. If you've played the game, you may think this is the ice prison of King Cerberus, but the boss arena actually looks completely different. You can't see this massive organ in any mission besides these two either. Here's another interesting thing. During the final battle against Urizen, the villain claims everything around him and Dante is just an illusion, woven by the Clifoth fruit. In fact, this isn't too far from the truth where level designers had to employ some trickery themselves to create a level that collapses into broken glass. The ceiling effect is simple enough. The boss fight takes place in the middle of an invisible globe with its inner side covered in the cracked glass texture and animated streams of blood. Outside the sphere, the space is fully modeled, but only as much as necessary. The house is empty inside, and the fields are, of course, low in detail. It all comes together for a climactic stage to set the battle in. The most impressive work that Capcom laid behind the scenes, however, is definitely on the cutscenes for the game. The game uses a simple trick for the cutscenes. Every time the camera angle changes, the lighting, the characters, and objects all around are set in the right position for the shot. The opening credits after the prologue are a prime example of this. Developers create an impression that Nico's van is driven several kilometers through the city while crushing crowds of enemies. But in fact, the car moves several times along the same street, constantly teleporting to the beginning of the road. Several cameras placed along the path create the illusion of continuous movement, while in fact there is none. When there is a need to set an action moment, a couple of demons simply appear on the same segment of the path to be effectively killed. The same technique works if there is a need to show characters walking somewhere in the same direction. Heroes are teleported back and forth while a well-chosen framing of the shot hides them actually stomping in one place. That's an example of how the scenes in Clifoth from the 10th mission are built. This approach optimizes the game, preventing it from biting into your hardware so violently. Another optimization technique is to make characters' faces disappear when they're not in view of the camera. Because of this optimization method, the game is full of moments when models are completely headless while out of frame. If you remember how proud the developers were about their photorealistic face scanning technology during the marketing for the game, this technique is just what they have to do to make full use of them. It's just one of the many tricks used to hit the target frame rates on past gen and weaker machines. In the now iconic scene where Nero is tragically separated from his demonic arm, Virgil simply slides out of the floor and freaks out a bit while he is out of frame. Nico and Crew Cut also decided to stick around from previous levels instead of unloading. Up to three copies of Nico can even spawn at once in this scene. A similar thing happens after the final battle with Virgil, where Dante's model continues to just chill, lying around in the background. During the flashback in the Sparta Mansion, the blinking is done by using an animated black texture superimposed on top of the camera, and for the sake of optimization, little Dante is nothing but a pair of flying hands. By the way, when Eva leaves the frame, she simply freezes in place, continuing to scream with fear. The first encounter with each new enemy is accompanied by a cool freeze frame done in a pretty simple way. At the right moment, everything except the monster itself is hidden from the level and its name appears on the layer with the game interface. The squad of Angelos makes their appearance in Mission 7. As you see in the cutscene, Proto Angelo enters with a dramatic superhero landing. However, his underlings, the Scudo Angelos, have a different idea. The first one slides from under the floor, and his friends appear around him later. During one of Urizen's pretentious speeches, we can fly off to the edge of the arena. There we'll find the end of the mocap session with an actor taking a T-pose. 
The scene in Dante's office is crammed with strange moments like heroes sitting in the air with objects appearing and disappearing in their hands. In fact, disappearing items are another thing in Devil May Cry 5. Heroes constantly manage to lose their weapons, and sometimes the weapons are everything that remains of the character. In another case, the girls can literally lose their heads or a slight collapse can occur with their bodies. In general, the cutscenes of Devil May Cry 5 are a real form of art at hiding all the tricks developers have up their sleeves. Perfect timing. That was our journey beyond the camera of Devil May Cry 5. Special thanks to Patreon, VK Donut, and Boosty subscribers whose support helps Crazy release videos like this. Don't forget to follow the links in the description where you can find even more interesting videos and Crazy's social networks. And if you are interested in speedrunning and its intricacies, check out my YouTube and Twitch channels. See you soon.